You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. On today's show, we have what some people might consider a rather bizarre topic. We are going to be talking about earthworms. An hour of earthworms. Charles Darwin wrote, quote, It may be doubted whether there are any other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as have these lowly creatures. End quote. Now, did Darwin have a premonition about Bush and Cheney? No. Darwin was talking about earthworms. Because without the earthworm, we probably wouldn't be here. So we decided to do a show about earthworms, and today is especially appropriate. Um, If you're in Santa Barbara, you know it's pouring rain outside, and you can see worms everywhere, so today might be a good day to go out and see if you can see some, and rather than step on them, maybe after the show you'll have an appreciation, a special appreciation for the worms in our lives. And throw them back in the dirt, which is what they'd prefer. Yes, exactly. So we thought this would be a good way to honor the earthworm is to devote this hour to singing their praises. And we have two interviews for you today. The first one is with permaculture enthusiast and longtime organic gardener, Kali Kogel. And Kali will be talking about the virtues of red wigglers and how to make your own vermiculture bin. And after that, we have another interview to share with you with... Lumbrucus terrestris, Mr. or Ms. I guess I was. Oh, yes. both, Mr. Ms. Well, you'll see. Yeah. And he or she, well, or he, <laughs> she, it, <laughs> will be joining us in the studio later today. Um, and he or she, Lumbrucus, will be enlightening us about the daily lives of earthworms from a rather unique stand, or should I say, crawl point. And let's see, where should we start with earthworms? I guess we wanted to get an idea of what kind of reputation earthworms have in Santa Barbara and with the public. So we took our mini disc out into the streets to find out. And here are some of the answers that we received. When you think of earthworms, what comes to mind? Ooh, they're good for the soil. They're slimy. (laughs) And I hate touching them. Do you know what they do in the soil? Um, It's something about the worm casing. They're worm poop. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> worm byproduct. <laughs> I think of those sickos on Fear Factor that eat them. What do they do? They're challenged to eat gross stuff like earthworms. Do they eat them? I don't I have cable. Oh, yeah, they eat them. Like crazy, they eat them. Fishing. Great. Anything else? Well, I know they're really good for the soil, and they help aerate the soil and everything in people's gardens and so forth, but I don't do a lot of gardening myself, so... I don't uh, get in touch with them very often. Uh, Recycling food and compost and such like. My friends have got this big earthworm sort of like place back home. So they put in all their old egg boxes to insulate it and plenty of vegetables and stuff stuff like that, you know, and make sure you don't put meat or tea bags in there. And they pretty much do the whole garden with it. It is pretty good. So I'm trying to get a little wormery at home back in England myself, like, but my parents aren't too keen on the idea just yet, but I wouldn't mind myself personally. Gardens? I don't know. In my old school, I had to work in gardens a lot, and there's just a lot of worms and stuff. They really help in composting the dirt, and they they eat the dirt, and they poop it out, and it's more f- fertile for the plants to grow. Um, I think of something squishy and kind of weird. <laughs> Earthworm. Uh, looks like it's something that we need in the planet to get rid of uh, the bad bacteria, but... Um, I don't know if you want to be overpopulated by <laughs> worms. Earthworms. I think of little worms that live onto the earth, basically. So when you think of earthworms, what do you think of, or what are your feelings about them? Or do you ever even think about them? 
I do think about earthworms. I really like earthworms. I've eaten an earthworm. And I think they're very good for the soil. I think they break up the soil and aerate the soil, and their castings are really good for uh, fertilizer. And I think there should be more worms. <laughs> and what? There's like ten foot worms in Africa, isn't there? Yes, or like a twenty-two foot one in Australia or something. <laughs> <laughs> now the question that I have to ask is, why did you eat the worm, and what did it taste like? Um, I ate the worm. It was part of a thing at this camp I went to called Sly Park up in Sacramento, around Sacramento area, and it was kind of a thing. You got a T-shirt for eating the worm. And I was the only kid in my camp that did it. Well, what did it taste like? Do you remember? It was cold and slimy and I just swallowed it. And I'm sure it went down very easily. It did. It went down very easily. It was probably like a six inch worm. <laughs> I felt it going down my gut, my gullet. Yeah. <laughs> Not a good memory. Sorry, I had to bring that memory back. <laughs> oh, that's a good memory. It was fun. So was it a nice t-shirt? Yes, I've actually um, eaten uh, worms and grubs and all kinds of stuff for survival purposes and doing, like, hiking and survival and stuff like that, so I don't mind worms. What's your favorite one to eat? Uh, I'd have to say termite grubs, pretty good. Crickets are all right. Crickets are pretty good. You can fry up crickets in a little pan and eat them. <laughs> I came to the right person. <laughs> <laughs> I like bugs. Wet, rain, squirmy, gross. <laughs> uh, long, slimy, brown... That's about it. Have you ever seen an earthworm? Yeah. And what do you think of them? Gross. <laughs> Wriggly, horrible little thing. Do you like them? No, I don't. What do you do when you see one? I just kind of ignore them. Or I throw them in someone else's yard. That was a wise man. <laughs> no, if you're listening, that you really are wise. And his garden must yeah. not be doing very well. <laughs> So why why do Suzanne and I think that earthworms are so amazing? Here are some interesting facts that we found out about them. Even though they just look like earthworms, they really are, according to Bill Mollison, the co-founder of Permaculture, quote, an army of pistons, end quote. Bill Mollison says, he points out that by sliding in their tunnels, earthworms act as an innumer innumerable army of pistons pumping air in and out of the soils on a 24-hour cycle even more rapidly at night. And research has shown that fresh earthworm casts are five times richer in available nitrogen, seven times richer in available phosphates, and 11 times richer in available potash than the surrounding upper six inches of soil. And there are 2,700 different kinds of earthworms. Aristotle called earthworms the intestines of the earth. And here's a fact I didn't know, that plant roots often seek out the earthworm casts. They follow the worm burrows and feed on the more available nutrients in the immediate vicinity, even if it means that the roots have to grow upward. So now we're going to play our interview with Kali Kogel. And again, Kali is a permaculture enthusiast and longtime organic gardener. And Kali builds worm bins and installed organic gardens in Santa Barbara for six years. For the past six years, she's done that. And in this interview, Kali enlightens us about vermiculture, the practice of feeding organic waste to earthworms to decompose or digest it. And Jill interviewed Kali in Santa Barbara. Today we're going to be talking about vermiculture, I think is the term. And I'm curious how you got involved in organic gardening and vermiculture. This goes pretty far back when I realized that I wanted to improve my situation in the garden. And I don't didn't know what the word was then, but I didn't want to just pour a bunch of chemicals into the ground. It didn't make sense to me, so I wanted to learn more about how... How to make the plants more alive <laughs> in a really basic way. And so I was learning about imitating nature. I mean, how does the plants thrive in nature? And and it led me to the principles of permaculture. And then in that way, composting led me to vermiculture. Let's get into the red, wig red wigglers. So that's an interesting na <laughs> name yeah. for them. Do they wiggle around all day? <laughs> Yeah, they kind of do, and they are uh, red, and they kind of they move in in colonies, and they they thrive in in this environment that you're going to create with your vermiculture compost bin. Could you describe um, to our listeners, many who probably haven't heard of this, what is worm or vermiculture or worm composting? Vermiculture is a way to recycle our food waste and turn it into a dark, rich 
organic matter that you can return to the soil, which we're, we're in badly in need of in a, the way our soil is these days. So, so basically you're saying we could take um, kitchen waste. In other words, if I make a big salad and I have like potato skins and carrot tops and all those things that we don't eat, maybe a few leftover things, I could actually give that to worms and they'll turn it into a rich, dark matter that's positive for the soil? Believe it or not, it's so amazing. They're like magic, the little workers. They, Like I said, they live and thrive for that. And uh, in the right conditions, those in the, um, and the microorganisms that surround that whole setup, once you get it all established, everything is being broken down constantly. When you unfold layers of uh, leaves in your garden, you see and smell that dark richness, and that's what's going on, that activity very slowly. The worms seem so tiny, and the food scraps seem so big. How does it happen? Yeah, and that's uh, the beauty of the system when you when you really get to know your worms. And it is a relationship. I mean, they are living beings, and so you need to care for them once you take on this responsibility. I mean, it sounds a little weird, but I love I love the worms, and and so you create the ideal environment to make it make the system work uh, efficiently. And so you want to. Um, prepare the food just a little bit more than than just cut the top off that like sauteing it up or <laughs> no not sauteing and uh, no as much as chopping that up smaller just do a little bit of their job for them even though they're perfectly capable of breaking down cardboard and actually they love cardboard in terms of bedding and which is very important we'll get to that later and um and they eat it i live in an apartment downtown and i don't have a compost pile right now and it's very painful for me to throw away all those food, like organic food matter into the trash in a plastic bag. Recycled plastic, but it still doesn't feel any better. So what would I do? What would be the first steps for me to begin a worm comp- what do you, worm composting box? Or Yeah, that's what you'd call it. Your your worm box, your worm bin. And, uh, and uh, I would imagine the first thing you'd want to do is decide, start looking at the volume of your food waste and meaning uh, try to measure whether it would be for instance a gallon if you started to collect it in your kitchen a week or five gallons a week think of a little pot container pot um, or something that you can cover and and, uh, either go ahead and do it start collecting it and measure that and find out what what size bin Let's determine what size bin you're going to actually need. And then we'll determine um, what your resources are. If you have an old uh, dresser drawer or something that you want to recycle. Or you have a um, an, an old plastic storage bin. And I've, I've heard those being um, used. And so you're kind of recycling those things as well by putting them to a different use. And so you get a, get a little creative. Uh, the ideal is, is wood. Wooden box, um, they make them specifically for worms. Believe it or not, there's whole outfits out there that uh, do that. And actually, locally, uh, I'd like to give a couple local resources. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, organic garden store, Island Seed and Feed, and they have, uh, they've really got it down. They actually recycled old cedar fencing. And they collect it and cut it up and make the ideal shape uh, worm bin. You recommend wood just because it's a natural material. It's probably more breathable, maybe. Yeah, wood is ideal because it does. Um, it's more absorbent and it, it provides a little bit more insulation for the worms. And it needs to have holes or be able to have circulation, aeration, just like us humans. We need we need air, and um, and we can't breathe when it's too wet. So um, there, that's another thing to remember when we move on through the bedding and everything. What conditions to keep it. Is this something that you keep indoors, like in your living room, like a fish aquarium? <laughs> you can watch the worms, or is it an outdoor um, thing? <laughs> okay, yeah. It can be indoor or outdoor. I wouldn't recommend the living room. It really, the location is going to, it's going to work. Uh, it's going to be what works for you in your your whole lifestyle. It's going to fit into your life. You're not going to try to make a certain system work, because uh, really what goes on with food waste is it's near, in or near the kitchen. And so if you have a little area where the ideal, I mean, is is probably just outside the kitchen door or on a little porch or something, keeping the temperature between 40 and 80 degrees uh, consistently um, 
You know, it's a wide range of never in the sun necessarily unless you can keep them really cool uh, inside in the bedding. And that's kind of hard to do when it's in the sun. So because there are always ways to warm up the bed. There aren't that many ways to cool it down because you can't just spray water or anything on it. And certainly not ice cubes. <laughs> Sounds like it would not be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so just to know, uh, we have the perfect look at us here at Santa Barbara. We can do it. We can do all this. We can garden all year round and we can keep our... Our worms happy all year round. So you go out, you have a dresser drawer, old dresser drawer, or you find a wooden box with a snug fitting top and you put holes in the bottom. What is your next step then? How how would you know what to put in there? Yeah. Okay, so you have to think about um, how are the worms, are they just going to crawl around on the sides or what? No, they're going to hang out in the bedding. The bedding is very important, even before the food, obviously, because they're going to need some place to get settled and get in their little colony that likes to move around through food. Uh, you want to also, again, I recommend using something that you something that you have in the house every day. And what comes to mind mostly for for most people is newspaper. I mean, the newsprint oftentimes is soy based ink anyway. And it's not just. I mean, you could do some layering with full sheets. That's really just the basic, basic, quickie way. But I would definitely recommend just shredding it in one to two inch wide strips. And it's not that difficult. It's become meditative after a while. If you just get into the habit of taking your, your piled up newspapers and start shredding them and giving them a good um, thickness of paper. That's something you can incorporate into when you're, when you're feeding. Yeah, just go ahead and get the box started with those. Uh, you want to dampen the bedding a little bit, kind of like a dried, a wrung out sponge, that kind of uh, consistency. And then put it in and just enough nut so it's dripping, just so it just absorbs the... Uh, you definitely don't want standing water. And uh, as a matter of fact, the benefit of having holes in the bottom of as particularly a wood bin is that, um, and, and, and plastic for that matter, is you can catch that. And w- uh, after it gets established in a couple of months, actually whatever drips through is a very fine liquid fertilizer, uh, compost. Uh, and so... Um, you would put that on your plants or in the soil? As a foliar in particular, I... I there is such a thing as compost tea, and we can get into that in another another time. So you go home. You do you put the worms right on top of the newspaper strips, or do you have to put something else in there first? Again, r- shredded newspaper, dampen them. You can put the worms in. You don't necessarily want to feed them yet. Uh, let them get all comfortable in there. And um, your first feeding will be in a. It's not just going to be spread all over, uh, and the worms will just go down to whatever level they want at that time uh, when you ent- inter- uh, uh, introduce them to their new home. Then when you, uh, maybe a week or two later, when you go to feed them, your first feeding is going to be in one section, kind of kind of section off your bin, depending on what size you get. You could put it into four sections or six sections. I wouldn't recommend any less than four because that creates, as you can tell, if you feed in each section, it's more frequent feeding, and they may not be uh, ready to move on to the next section Yet, if you can visualize this pattern, uh, actually make a make a template on the on the underside of the lid of your bin, and just go ahead and draw it up there. And then, if your whole family is involved, which would be really great, it's really exciting and fun for for kids too. Then everybody will know which section you're feeding in next. Okay, so you never want to kind of keep yeah, putting no, the food back in the same right. section. What's going to happen is if it's not um, com- uh, it's not if the worms aren't ready for it, meaning if it's not broken down enough, they don't like fresh cut food basically they like it to be decomposed a little bit so uh, when you feed them for the first time we'll put it in one section and uh, cover it that's the key is um, you'll notice cats do that and you can either add more or just kind of cover with the if you put enough bedding in there you'll know once you start working uh, the whole system uh, you actually want to maybe add a little bit of bedding each time once it gets established. I assume the bedding was just the very bottom layer, but actually you're filling the whole bin with the newspaper strips. Okay, the initial bedding, you're not really filling it, uh, but you're putting quite a few uh, stacks of newspapers. Once you start shredding them, you'll see that it, it, it gets a little fluffy, and then you get a little damp, and it gets a little... Uh, Maybe a little more compressed. They don't like it compressed either, so you want to kind of fluff it up. Uh, just um, imagine moving through that. Imagine having to move through that. And the, and the worms are pretty amazing. They get through just the, the one or two pages. And have you ever tried to open a wet newspaper? It's very difficult. But they get in there and they get all happy and cozy and do the wild thing and everything. So um, 
they they really their colony your colony will grow and then uh, well that's getting a little too far ahead but then you can actually start another bin and start your neighbor on one with the same some of the same worms that you started with the same relatives <laughs> they they kind of have a short lifespan uh, I'm not certain exactly how how long they live but you could check this is a fascinating website um, the soil food web. This is uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham. She's just amazing. Anyway, check out that website. It's fascinating. Right and she'll probably say just how long they live. And so you're you're going to be able to identify the babies and the, and the eggs and everything once you get to know your worm bin. So, uh, okay, great. So the bedding we are um, adding after we feed. And, and that's the perfect time to add the bedding. And then that will keep it at a nice... Um, level because you're covering, you're burying the food. Mm-hmm. When the worms are ready to move to that section, when they th- they're ready, they're done with the other section, and they sent maybe they sense I don't know what they do. They send out little scouts. <laughs> Is that food ready yet? <laughs> All right, so we're going to the next section. They just kind of move around, and then it's a it's a self sustaining system. They're almost like domesticated worms. They kind of do become domesticated in that they, they wouldn't survive if you took the worms and put them directly into your garden. They're, they're used to being fed regularly. So worms, they can eat a quarter to a half of their weight per day. And you want to feed them lightly for the first few weeks and then let the decomposing, the, the other microorganisms get established. Their community also is vital to this whole system. And so that's that brings me to the next subject, which is what are those little critters crawling around in there? And are there going to be any flies? Also odors, too. Right. And so that's the whole idea of burying it, covering it up, um, not making it real friendly and accessible for the flies. And the other little crawly creatures are good. They are decomposers, so they're supposed to be there. They're like the little roly polies. They're as big as that and as little as things that you can't even see. So they're all in there doing the work, and that's what they love, and that's where they thrive, and that's okay. It's not doing any harm at all to the house or the garden, having them there. Even a few little spiders around will kind of keep the flies under control. So let them go and let them all hang out together and... uh, and just appreciate what's going on there. All that work that's being done for you. It's not like the days of having that big heap in the backyard uh, and turning it with a pitchfork. If you don't, it's not really going to work in this apartment kind of setting. Even if you do have a little garden, this is the ideal way. Anybody can do it. it just depends on the size. You you get used to the scale that you can operate and function with, and then then you're going to love it. What's the smallest size worm bin where they would be healthy? Okay, so you're imagining, um, to answer that question, I'm imagining the volume of food waste that a small family would have. And really, I wouldn't imagine, as I said before, if you quarter sections in a bin, it, it wouldn't be any smaller than two by three, two feet by three feet. Although that does sound a little large. Perhaps a storage bin, like one of those pl- plastic tubs that you carry with handles and it has a little lid, would be about the smallest. So you don't want anything way too big unless you're set up for a big operation. So say your worms are in there doing their thing. What, what's the purpose of this? We actually are diverting quite a bit of our waste from the landfill by doing this. Because not only are you going to feed um, your worms food waste, but what else is in the kitchen? You have paper plates, napkins, paper towels, and um, it would be great just to have your dish towel that you throw in the washer. That'd be great, but a lot of people are in this world of convenience, and you have a little party, and it's a lot easier to throw away paper plates than it is uh, do the dishes. So, great. If you're going to do that, let's do something with that, and uh, go ahead and shred it up, make it easy for the worms, put it in your worm bin. You can put a lot of things in, in the worm bin. And also, as I said before, we're turning badly needed um, organic matter to the soil by having this rich, yummy, dark compost um, available to us to put back in the garden. Basically, the worms are eating your food, and they're kind of nesting in the paper, and they eat the paper too? They do. They eat the paper too, and so you, that's why you need to keep adding it as well. And it can be done indoors and outdoors. Uh, if you pick up, when you pick up a worm, not if, because you're going to, you know you are after this, you're going to be like, I want to go do that. They're not slimy. They're not sticky. Things kind of stick to them, so it makes them look kind of sticky, but um, boy, they're just amazing. So you're putting in this food now. What are the worms' favorite foods? Do they have them? Are there things that they really love and thrive on? Do they love junk food? Or are you trying to feed them more healthy food? Or? They always say 
that compost and compost tea or however you make it is only as good as the ingredients. So yeah, we're we're assuming that you are eating organically and so the worms get to do that. And the the chemicals, the pesticides, it's they're pretty amazing. You're not going to kill them, uh, but I'd still encourage you to buy organic. Not, this is nothing personal with the worms, but basically you pretty really much don't want a system with meats, dairy, or fats, meaning like some oily, I mean, natural fats, avocado is great. And uh, though uh, most things uh, you can, eggshells, uh, pulverized eggshells, believe it or not, uh, uh, go ahead and chop up those avocado peels, uh, like I was saying. It just makes it a little bit faster for them. A lot faster, actually. Those things can sit around for a while. Um, Again, your lettuces, they just go through that stuff. Tea bags, coffee grounds, your whole kitchen. Take a look at it. See what's going on in there. And uh, you'll see that a lot of it's recyclable with worms. Do you give them tea bags with caffeine? (laughs) That's what I was alluding to before. Amped up worms. Wait until you see them work now. Weren't you building these and selling them? Yeah. I mean, basically, I love it. I didn't study it. And uh, I learned through being with them. And that's what I'm just sharing is my experience with them. And that if I can do it, everybody can do it. (laughs) It's that easy. And it's that much fun. You're doing all this to get the worm castings, which are actually the worm's excrement. Yes, exactly. And they sell the worm castings. They're very expensive. And here you are making your own. It's just it's just wonderful. There's a company called Worm Gold, so it is magic. It's gold. How long does it take usually from when you first start your bin? Probably a basic household. A couple of months um, before, once you get your system up and running, and then it goes through the whole cycle. Do plants thrive when you um, put the worm casti- castings on them? Yes, they do. And because in the castings are, again, all those other microorganisms. And that is the life of the soil. And the health of the soil is is what determines the health of the plant. So basically what you're doing is you're treating the soil, not the plant. The plant is where you see the evidence. You're almost a barometer of the healthiness of the soil. That's correct. What you do too, maybe, is um, have your worm bin and then let the tea or whatever is coming out, the liquid drain into the soil, and then maybe move your worm bin and plant something underneath where the worm bin was. Excellent idea. That's great. So you've already visualized the whole system. You can see how you can move it around and also how it would benefit in your garden. That's awesome. And that was Kali Kogel. And if you'd like to reach Kali, if you have any questions about vermiculture, organic gardening, etc., her email is greenkali at yahoo.com. That's the color green, G-R-E-E-N-K-A-L-I at yahoo.com. And I just wanted to say, too, that Kali and I, during the interview, we did have a nice goodbye, but the mini-disc batteries ran out. (laughs) So what you should have heard at the end was, thank you, Kali, thank you, Jill. Here's my email. So her email again is greenkali at yahoo.com. Now it's time for our second interview, and it's a bit unusual, and it's an exclusive interview, and we just happened to, we're lucky enough to get an interview with Limbrucus terrestris, and I could be saying that name wrong, could be Limbricus terrestris, but I'm not sure. Anyway, um, Limbricus terrestris is a large reddish worm native to Europe. Um, This worm has an unusual habit of copulating on the surface of the soil at night, which makes him more visible than most other earthworms. Limbrugus is a bit out of his element this morning. He joins us in the studio today from a small box, and here he is. Wait, Suze, can you get him situated? I have to move the mic down. Okay, I have to bring him over to the mic. Is he ready? Not yet. Okay, we're getting him ready. Can you move it down a little bit more? Yep. You ready? Let's get him. He's still not. He's a little shy this morning, I think. And I think Limbrucus is ready, and here he is. We're very pleased to be able to bring you an exclusive interview with a Limbrucus terrestris. And, you know, your story really touched our hearts, and we wanted the thousands of people who listen to our show to be able to hear your touching tale. Could you just start at the beginning and maybe let us know how did you end up in a parking lot drying up shriveled in the sun? Well, actually there were some kids and they they thought it'd be fun to watch a worm just, you know, just lose all of its slime. Maybe you can inform our listeners exactly what a Lumbrucus terrestris is and 
by the way, do you mind if I call you Lumbrucus? No, not at all. My friends call me that. Um, well, I don't, I, I, I'm, what I am is, um, I'm an earthworm. I live where there is food, moisture, oxygen, and a favorable temperature. If I don't have these things, I go somewhere else. And what exactly do you do? I know I've seen you guys, like if I dig parts of my garden up or something, what do you do underground all day and night? Uh, I like to tunnel deeply in the soil and bring subsoil closer to the surface, mixing it with the topsoil. And I've heard that you're indispensable for healthy soil. Could you explain to listeners why that is and what do you do to the soil? Well, what I do is... Um, I, I put out a secretion. Um, I eat the soil and, and the um, plant life under the ground. And then my slime or secretion um, contains nitrogen. Nitrogen is important for all plants. And then I noticed, too, some people are actually, they have worm bins at their house. Now, and they talk very highly about worm castings. What are worm castings? Well, it's when I ingest the soil or the plant material, and it goes through my body and then comes out in castings. What is a casting? Well, some would call it a poop. Interesting. So so you've been underground doing all this hard work all day and night. How did you end up in a parking lot drying in the sun? Well, like I said, some people don't take us seriously. They don't think that we help, and so... They like to want, they think, you know, if they're not, if they're not, um, informed about how, how wonderful we are for the soil, they'll just take us and they'll throw us in the parking lot on a hot, on a hot slab and they just like to watch us reel in pain and just, and disintegrate in our sticky slime. Um, it it comes, uh, you know, it melts in the sun, so to speak, and so do we. That's tragic. Now, this is a somewhat personal question, but I've heard that worms are hermaphrodites. Is that correct? Yes. Actually, um, for a while there, when I was growing up, I thought I had a girlfriend. But then I found out that we were both sexes, which kind of bummed me out. But then, um, see, the thing is that um, we are hermaphrodites, which means um, we are both male. We have both male and female organs. And and we mate by joining our clydella, or it's a swollen area near my head, and, and um, it's, I exchange sperm with the other worm. Interesting. What would happen if someone sprayed their yard or sprayed their garden with pesticides or chemicals? How would that affect you? Put it this way, most people think that we're only good for fish bait. Well, think again. The earthworm is one of nature's top soil scientists. The earthworm is responsible for a lot of things that help make our soil good enough to grow healthy plants and provide us food. We increase the amount of air and water that gets into the soil and break down organic matter like leaves, grass, and things that plants can use. So... What was your question? (laughs) It sounds like you have a bit of a chip on your, I would say, shoulder, but you're just one long tube. This might be out of bounds, but I've been wondering about this. It's kind of an urban legend. If we cut you in half, would you grow back? No. Well, actually, yes. Just don't cut off my head. I won't grow back. If you cut off my tail, I'll be okay. How can I tell the difference? Well, my head's swollen. So I hear that you, you were telling me earlier after I put you in a little bit of water and revived you, that you lived happily in an organic garden and yard for decades or for a long time. And (laughs) two days, lady. No, I'm kidding. And that then some new owners moved into your yard and began spraying the yard with pesticides. Now, what did that feel like? That was the most horrible day of my life. My friends and I tried to flee. We tried, but you can only go so, so fast when you're an earthworm, you know? Like, you're down there, you're in the soil, you're turning around the soil, bringing down organic matter from the top and mixing it with the soil below. I mean, 
I have a job to do, you know. A worm has a job making fertilizer, you know, and that's my job. And when I felt this hitting the soil, it stung my body. And we we were trying to get away as fast as we could, but before we knew it, we were paralyzed. And then our body, our bodies inside our organs began to shut down. And then that was all I remember. And luckily, Lumbrucus, I plucked you up off the ground and brought you to our organic garden. And how does that feel now to have a new, would you say you have a new lease on life? Yes, and plus I have 500,000 new worm friends living in the acre of soil that I live on. We make 50 tons of castings or poop. That is like living, that, that's like lining up 100,000 one-pound coffee cans filled with castings. That is amazing. Wow. I know. I think so. And and I feel so happy now because I can burrow into to my soil with, with a clear conscience, knowing that no one's going to harm me or my family or friends. And, and, and it's unbelievable because I'm just a little old worm. Pretty amazing, don't you think? It is very amazing. And... Now, Lumbrucus, if you could give one message to humankind, or human unkind, whatever it may be, what would you want to say to them? Something that they you would like them to know about earthworms. I would say that having worms around in your garden is a really good sign that you have a healthy soil. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. And do you have a philosophy in life that you kind of live by or eat soil by yes temperature light water air nutrient nutrients time and room to growl thank you this has been an honor now do you want me to go throw you back out into the garden plot please thank you Lumbrucus. that was wonderful yes. and if you'd like to contact Lumbrucus, you can go out at night and look for him possibly copulating <laughs> above ground with himself or with his other hermaphrodite <laughs> friends. Or um, you can dig a little bit under the soil surface and find he or she and his many relatives, although today you may find them laying on top of the soil. And in that case, please put them back off the sidewalk especially. No hot asphalt for them. No, they're very important for our ecosystem. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.